Coming up next, I'm going to reveal seven career decisions that if you make, you will regret. And then Target is up in the ante on their minimum wage. I'll tell you what it is. And, of course, we're going to take your calls, and it gets going right now. All right, folks, helping you win at work and in life. This is the Ken Coleman Show. That's it. What are we doing there? I want you to make more money, and I want you to experience more meaning. I want to raise your income, help you raise it, and I want to help you raise your impact. This is where purpose comes alive. And, and work is a whole different ball game, and there's no stopping you. 844-747-2577. Okay, let's get right to it. Seven decisions that will create regret. I'm just going to tell you. Now, there's probably 70, but I'm just going to boil these down because these are ones that I hear from you on the show. I see it in social media. I read the data. Here we go. Before we break down the seven, Carl Polemer, I hope that's how you say it, a gerontologist at Cornell University, and his team interviewed 1,500 people for a study uh, over the age of 65 about what haunts them most Look for the word regret here. What do they regret most about their life choices? Now, this is a life question. (laughs) However, not taking enough professional risk or career chances was number seven. Higher on their list of regrets than not taking enough care of their body. So it's a life question. Now you think for one second, I want you to really grasp the the heaviness of this. Of all of the things that people over the age of 65 could reflect on and say, I wish I had done this. I wish I had done this. I mean, there's a lot of things. Think of just of all the relational things. The experiential things. Work, a work-related regret. Number seven, I, we, let, let me just call this out. A lot of new people to the show coming in and out. Some of you are going, all right, uh, let me see if that, do I really believe there's purpose in work? Is this guy, is this just another motivational bunch of gibberish? No, even if you don't realize it, you long to make a difference in this world. I think you know that. But I think a lot of people don't believe that there's a way to make a really unique difference through your work besides a paycheck that would allow you to do great things for your family and your friends. So here are seven decisions, if you will, choices that will cause regret for you as it relates to your professional life. One is pursuing just the paycheck, just the bigger paycheck. We get calls all the time on the show. Ken, I took a promotion. I need help because I'm six weeks in and I know it's not right. Why? Well, there's a whole host of mistakes that were made, but the driving force behind those type of scenarios is that they didn't pursue purpose. They didn't pursue passion, work that they love. They didn't pursue mission, results that they want to produce in the world. They just went, I'm good at this. They want me. They like me. I want more money. Woo-hoo! And that wears off. We humans adapt just like that. And you, the paycheck will wear off. I, I will tell you this. First time I've said this on the show. I'm anxious to see what happens when the great resignation finally kind of comes to, you know, we, we, we see kind of normal moves every month, but not this unbelievable migration of people just leaving. I'm very anxious to see how many people make even more moves because they chased a bigger paycheck. More on that later. Target. Up in the ante big time. Talk about that next segment. Target's an example. Target is, is offering another unbelievable carrot, and people will chase that carrot. That's the first biggie. Don't pursue the bigger paycheck. Pursue bigger meaning. Second regret or mistake, settling. I'm just going to simplify that. Settling for a okay job. Settling for an average culture. 
settling for a safe career path. This is what Theodore Roosevelt talked about in his famous Man in the Arena speech, those cold and timid souls who know neither victory or defeat. They, they just kind of right along. Number three, not fighting for what you believe in. Now, let me just dial that down a little bit. Not standing up when wrong is done in front of you in the workplace. Not standing up for your principles and making a decision that you know is right but could be scary. That leads to number four. Quieting your principles. Quieting your principles. Meaning, eh, I don't like it. Doesn't feel right. I'm going to change my principles. I'm going to shift my thinking in order to be able to live with what I see happening. Let me personalize this a little bit more. What I'm talking about here is, is if you are being mistreated by a leader, instead of going, you know what, that's not right. I don't believe I should be treated that way by my leader or my coworkers and doing something about it. This is you going, well, maybe I'm just a little too sensitive. Maybe I'm this, 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 and this. And you allow yourself to put up a garbage and your soul dies a little bit each day. Number five, not learning from your mistakes and your poor decisions. Let me delineate. Mistake is I'm walking down the hall. I'm looking at my phone instead of paying attention in the hallway. I glance up just in time to almost completely run over somebody, but I knocked her coffee over. This is a mistake. You know, this is like, oh, I, I, that was a mistake. A, a, a bad decision is to do something unethical, to cheat your company, to berate or belittle somebody, whatever it is. There's a difference between a premeditated bad decision. You're going, you know what? I don't feel good about this. I'm going to whatever. Versus a, I wasn't thinking, I really wasn't paying attention. This is a mistake. But we got to learn from these things. I can't tell you how many adults never get to the point where they go, I've got to learn from it. I can't just be aware of it and own it. Like owning the mistake is, yeah, I did that. But not to actually learn something from it, a poor decision where you went to work for a company you know now you shouldn't have gone to work for what do you learn from this or just going i acknowledge i shouldn't have went to work for this company i'm gonna go well let's spin the wheel and see what i can find next no what do we learn from it that leads into the sixth one where you break trust with your peers at the office you've made a poor decision or maybe a mistake but you don't learn from it to the point that you then not just own it, but change it and correct it. Then people start to just distrust you. But you're an unhealthy person that I don't want to be around them. They're not willing to change. Coming up next, the seventh decision. You were created to fill a unique role in and through your work. Now, some of you may be going, I have no idea what that is. Some of you may be saying, I know what I want to do, but I don't know how to get there. I felt all of those emotions. I've been where you are, and I can tell you, there's hope. That's why I wrote the book, From Paycheck to Purpose. You can make the income you want and the impact that you desire, and I know that you have what it takes. All right, folks, welcome back to the Kid Coleman Show. Uh, all right, last segment we were talking about seven career decisions that if you make these, you will regret them. And uh, boy, I love I love the old holdover. So what's the seventh one? Let's quick review. Number one, pursuing a bigger paycheck, not bigger meaning. Number two, settling for things average, below average, settling, not pursuing 
I'm just going to settle for this. There's no sense in trying to do anything better, be anything better. Number four, not fighting for what you believe in. Four, changing the way you believe just because you want to go along to get along. Number five, taking not taking ownership for your mistakes and poor decisions. And then six, breaking trust with your peers. That leads to seven. And I think the most fatal career-killing decision that there is is making decisions based on fear. Deciding to do something or not to do something based solely on fear. It, 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 it sidelines so many beautiful dreams. It, it, it brings to a halt so much opportunity. Making a decision or not making a decision based solely on fear. Not, and now hear, hear what I'm saying. Fear can protect us and fear can paralyze us. I'm saying just the fear, unchallenged fear. Decisions that are made or decisions that are not made based solely on fear and we don't check into it and say, is fear telling me the truth here? Is it in fact protecting me from something? Or is fear lying to me and holding me back? But here's what the natural reaction to fear is for humans. Oh! Warning sign, eh, 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 and we retreat as opposed to going, wait a second, how long has that been going? Just, just curious in the control booth. Just a quick poll. Uh, I won't make you speak on the mic. If you speed up when you see a yellow light, raise your hand. Oh, if you slow down when you see a yellow light, raise your hand. I think Nathan's abstaining from the vote. And Nathan's busy directing, which I understand and I appreciate you are allowed it. By the way, abstaining from a vote is an actual recorded vote in Congress. I had somebody get mad at me one time because I didn't vote in a certain election. I'm not going to get into that right now. Like, I can't believe you, of all people, Coleman, you voted uh, every election. I said, hey, abstaining because I don't like the options is an actual vote. Just There's a little extra civics 101 because I'm a man of the people and I like to teach you folks stuff. There you go. Don't let fear paralyze you. Allow fear to protect you, but the only way we know is if we dive into it. I'm the guy who speeds up at the yellow light because I'm like, hey, there's, there's, there's time for some more getting. If I see a warning sign, uh, this drives Stacy nuts. All right, this is full disclosure. Uh, Joe is laughing because he knows me very well on this. I'll drive up in Leaper's Fork. There's a particular road near where I live where we get heavy rain and they close the road. Sometimes in anticipation of the rain, sometimes because it's flooded. But I've noticed folks and my team here in the control room, many times they forget to take the sign down or they're really slow in doing it. Do you know how I know this? Anybody want to take a guess how I know? Because I challenged the process. Many times I have pulled up to it moved the sign and driven the 50 to 75 yards around the corner to see has the water receded. And I have realized that many times it has. I'm a guy who goes, wait a second. Is there anything really be afraid of behind there or not? This is how I'm wired. I'm going to challenge the process. Oh, kid, be careful. Really? Do I have to be careful? Or do you think I need to be careful? Because there's a big, big difference between whether or not you think I need to be careful and whether or not I think I need to be careful. This is how I'm wired. And not everybody's wired that way, but I'm teaching from a place that is a natural condition for me to go, okay, I'm not saying I'm going to completely drive through it, Alex, but you better dang well guarantee I'm going to see if the water's there. Now, if the water's there, I'm not going to drive through in my little sedan. But if it's not there, you know what I'm doing? I'm moving the freaking sign, baby, and I don't care what Sheriff Rusty thinks. Because if Sheriff Rusty comes up to me and says, woo, 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 uh, Mr. Coleman, why did you go through there? Because, Rusty, you or the Leaper's Fork Department of Transportation didn't get out fast enough and move the freaking sign. I got somewhere to be. And this is the quickest way to get there. So here's my point in this whole silly explanation and metaphor. 
Alex, there's a point here. And the point is, dig into the fear. Before we make a decision based on fear, or we don't make a decision based on fear, have enough guts to examine the fear. And again, if the fear is protecting you, you're really smart and wise. If the fear is holding you back, you're really smart and you're really wise. This is the point. All right, good stuff. Okay, we got uh, fresh headlines. Let's get to it. We call it in the news. All right, uh, let's see here. We got a little CBS News headline and uh, Fox Business. Target raises its minimum wage to as much as $24 an hour. Uh, Workers at Target stores and distribution centers in places like New York, where competition for finding and hiring staff is the fiercest, they could see starting wages as high as $24 an hour. This is important because this is going to be regional. And again, this is what I was talking about earlier. Chasing the paycheck is a temporal thing. And a lot of companies are throwing out a higher paycheck just to get eyeballs. It's like clicks. They got a higher and it's very competitive. So in places like New York, you could see a $24 an hour minimum wage. Can we pause for a second? Thank you all very much. Can I teach some economics 101 that politicians won't tell you? When wages and salaries increase, companies' expenses increase. They're in business, not charity. They will find a way to pass it on to you. So, uh, Alex, I told Stacy about the story last night. Uh, we had a quiet moment with no teenagers. And I said, oh, by the way, I'm talking about this tomorrow. Uh, I said, it's 25. She loves Target. She calls it Target. A lot of women love Target, man. Uh, And I said, can you believe this? She goes, oh my gosh. I go, yeah, be careful at Target, would you please? Because she loves to go to Target. Well, guess what? They're going to pass that on to Stacy. So your little Lupa or Lufa or whatever they buy that was $8 is now going to be $12. I'm just keeping it real. This is Economics 101. Man, inflation. Um, okay. Inflation isn't some magical thing that just happens. All right. Anyway, so there you go. Uh, Minneapolis-based uh, retailer said they'll adopt minimum wages from 15 to 24 an hour. So here's my point. That's going to change by region, and it's all a carrot. Uh, and then one other quick headline. Small businesses still struggling financially. Fed survey finds. Uh, they are struggling financially, small businesses, because supply chain challenges and working challenges workers small business having a hard time competing with the targets of the world mom and pop store can't pay 24 bucks an hour and then you take supply chain issues on top of that there's inventory issues cost issues competition issues talent issues um, can i make a quick prediction on this i believe we're going to see a reset in the next six months in several areas I think foreclosures, bankruptcies are going to go up. That's going to cool the housing market in some ways. It's going to slow some things down. It's going to also reset some of this job market. Some will survive, some will not. It's going to be very interesting. Hang on. Don't get panicked. Don't make any dumb moves. Step into your fear. I'll be here for you if you need to call. All right, speaking of, coming up next, we take your calls. This is The Ken Coleman Show. According to Glassdoor, the average job offer attracts over 250 applicants. So if you've made it to the interview, you've already made a great impression. So now is your time to showcase how you are the best choice for this role. That's why we created How to Win the Interview. This free guide will walk you through the five strategies to help you stand out amongst the competition. With just a little intentionality, you can prepare yourself to win the interview. To get it, go to kencoleman.com interview.
All right, folks, helping you make more money and experience more meaning. That's what we do. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Here to help you win at work so you're winning at life because they are tied together. Um, It's pretty amazing. We are living in a world where you can do any number of things all with one click of a button. My new favorite thing, by the way, with one click, my uh, golf app. I can book a tee time, one click. It's very nice. Uh, What can you do with one click? Lots of things. But uh, you know what you really can do with one click is change your professional future. Uh, one click, finding a job that takes you from paycheck to purpose by visiting my friends at ZipRecruiter. Sign up for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Ken. ZipRecruiter can work for you. ZipRecruiter.com slash Ken. By the way, it's free. ZipRecruiter.com slash Ken. All right, to the phones we go. Morgan joins us in Kansas City, Missouri. Morgan, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. Thanks so much for taking my call. You bet. What's up? Well, basically, uh, my head and my heart are at odds, and I've heard you tell, you know, 100 people to follow their heart, but my head <laughs> thinks my heart is really dumb. Say that again. Um, Say that again. My head my head thinks my heart is really, really dumb. Oh, yeah, that's very, by the it way, that's is. pretty normal. So here's my situation. I have a job that I love for a company that I love, but about coming up on two years ago, my husband and I welcomed our first child. Yay. And as you know, that kind of changes everything. Oh, boy. So, yeah, my husband and I are farm kids, and now here we are in the city, and we realize we would love to raise our child, children, the way that we grew up. Yeah. Um, and I'm from a really close-knit family, but they live really far away, and our child is the only grandkid. Mm-hmm. So it would be really great to move toward my family Okay. Um, for that reason. So there's a job open in that area, um, but I don't know that I would love it. Do I apply for a job that would just be kind of eh, okay no. to get to where I want to go? No. Because what will happen is you'll get to where you want to go, and then if you still need to work, which I'm presuming you do, yes? Yes. You'll get there, and everything will be great, right? We'll hear the cows in the distance. You know, we'll smell them. We'll have all these great memories. Mom and Dad are there, all the things. But you're going to go from a job that you do love to a job you don't love, and that's going to weigh on you, even though you're close to family. Right. And I wish that my current job could be remote, but it just doesn't work that way with what I do. That's fine. So what kind of work do you so, want to do? What kind of work do I want to do? Yeah. Um, Meaning, we want to go back home. I get it. So what do you mm-hmm. want to do? This is a chance to reset or or do something similar to what you're doing now. That becomes the new standard, not this job that's available that you're going to go right. and pretty quickly you're going to be going through the motions. I just don't think you have to accept mediocrity. I just don't feel like the jobs up there are coming open very often, and if they are, they're not really optimized. So the only way I'm finding out about them is through the proximity principle, boots on the ground, put my message out there and say, hey, if you hear anything, let me know. Well, then because maybe maybe we need to go back and spend a few trips, take a couple vacation days, take some long weekends, get some boots yeah, on the ground. So, What kind of work do you want I to just, do? Well, I'm too afraid to work for myself. So that's a that's a long term dream. Maybe that someday I'll get brave enough to do that. But in the Time meantime, out. I like stop, stop, stop. I am not going to let you roll through that. I care about you too much, and you know that. Well, what are you eventually? The what's the dream? What is it? We'll I get- think just recently I've realized that I would like to um, start my own business in like food preparation and of preparing healthy meals for busy families that don't have time to do it themselves. So kind of like the Hello Fresh, those kind of kit things yeah, 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 for yeah. for people, especially if they can utilize local farmer produce or okay. even my own. What? Why can't we try that? Get it started on a very small side hustle level in this new smaller community where your parents probably know every freaking person on the planet at that town. Well, because of the income stability or lack thereof. No, 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 no. I don't want to move there without having the income. No, 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 no. I, I'm sorry. I didn't do a good job of giving you a scenario. I'm saying we find you a job that you really enjoy. That's the day job. And oh, then yeah, we, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> then we start this on the side. I know, but I want right. to I want to bring all this together. Mm-hmm. I don't want you to settle just because you're afraid. I think you could get this little food preparation thing going on the side, and it could turn into something due to all the relationships you're going to inherit. Plus, it's home. That's all I wanted to say on that. So what are you doing now, and what would you want back in this area? 
Um, the things that I'm doing now are like little technical things. I work in television and I do the rinky dink technical back end things that the creatives aren't good at. What does that mean? So I'm like, sort of a facilitator. Like lower thirds and what are you talking about? Um, I do, I set up compliance for closed captioning and, um, legal releases and rights and then uh, access throughout the building and processes. So I'm like a things and processes kind of person. So that's what I was getting at. Mm -hmm. So you are, I don't want to call it an office manager. I also don't want to call you a project manager, but you're somewhere in between there. You're administrative mm -hmm. process yeah, details. And and you enjoy that kind of work, purchasing. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, then this is all hands on deck. This is you changing the narrative in your head, which is, well, Ken, there's just not a lot of jobs that come up. I don't find out about them, blah, blah, blah. Wait a second. How many relatives do you guys have back in this town? Mm, 20. How many friends do you have? Not a lot. Okay. Back there, I mean, everybody kind of dispersed. Okay. My point is 20 relatives times however many people they know, they want you to come back big time, I'm guessing. Yes or no? Oh, yeah. Well, guess what? You want us to come back? You want to see grandbaby? I need you to be my detectives on the ground, finding anything and everything that is related to this type of work. Send them a job description because you know what it is. Let them start looking for you. Go visit. Do some Zoom interviews. Figure it out. The proximity principle. You can do this. You have everything you need to get the right gig back there. So get after it. Don't take this current one unless, let me, let me give you one exception. If that gets you there and it's stable and you won't be miserable, so you need to do more homework. I'm fine with you interviewing for it. Go all the way to the altar. Don't let them put the ring on your finger until you make sure that you won't be miserable. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right. That was my other thought is an application isn't an interview. Isn't no, a hire. no. Walk all the way down the aisle. Let them date you. Everything. But here's the deal. I'm okay with you taking it if there's two ifs. If you aren't going to be miserable in that culture and if you are committed to finding the right gig and you're not going to get all hung up and go, oh, I got to stay here for two years because I'll feel guilty if I leave them within six months. That's, that's my caveats. Mm -hmm. How's that feel? I think I'm pretty okay with that. I see most any position kind of as a new challenge, so it would be at least fun for a little while to learn it. I, but let me just say this. Those are caveats. It's not my, mm -hmm. it's not my recommendation. My recommendation is to be patient Put your friends and family to work for you there on that end. Tell them exactly what you're looking for. Describe the work. Send them a couple of examples of the job descriptions, and they start talking. Hey, let me tell you about Morgan, my daughter. She's a rock star, loves logistics, loves processes, very organized, got a lot of experience. Could be a game changer. I just don't think you're aware of everything that's there, and the reason you're not aware is because you're not getting after it. So I'm challenging you, not criticizing you, okay? Mm -hmm. Go do it. Find it. I'd be patient and wait for the right thing so that we're not making all kinds of transitions once we get there. But if you're just really wanting to get back there fast, I'm fine with it. But don't feel like you're an indentured servant and you got to wait for six years before you can leave them. That, that's the only challenge with my caveats. Yeah, a lot of people call and go, Ken, I feel so guilty about leaving. Why? You know, owe people your life. So you got to determine that, but I I, uh, I certainly understand the nature of the question and why you're doing it. So, you know, hang in there. Be patient is my preference. And I think the right thing will pop. I really do. I think it'll reveal itself. And then we move and do a good job, start our dream business on the side. Once we get stable, everybody's happy. Grandparents are happy. You're happy. We're all happy. Cows are happy. All of it. Don't move. More of your calls coming up. This is The Ken Coleman Show. Do you know what you were born to do? 
In order to get hired at a job you love, you need to get clear on your talent, passion, and mission. That's why our team created the Career Clarity Guide. In just a few minutes, this free tool will walk you through a process to discover what you do best, talent, the work you love to do, passion, and the results you want your work to produce. That's mission. Then you're going to feel way more confident throughout the job search process. To get started, go now to kencoleman.com slash clarity. All right, folks, welcome back to The Ken Coleman Show, helping you increase your income and your impact in this world through your work. You're enjoying work, you're enjoying life because you're on purpose, you're experiencing meaning. Oh, by the way, the money's going to be really nice as well. That's our goal here. That's what we do for you. I'm your coach. Let's go. 844-747-2577. Brisbane, Australia is where we go next. Sam is there. Sam, you're on The Ken Coleman Show. Hey, Ken. Great to hear from you, man. Great to hear from you, sir. Thank you for calling from the down under. Wow. Yeah, no worries. All good. <laughs> yeah, I've been looking to, I've been watching you for years now. Oh, it's well, good to be you. on the show. Thank you. By the way, I wish I sounded like you. I got to tell you, it just, you just sound so, I'm actually, so cool. I'm actually, I'm actually English. <laughs> oh, you are? <laughs> yeah. I thought yeah, it sounded yeah. a very, a little kind of itch. Where in England? Uh, near London. Uh-huh. A place called Farnham, a place called Farnham yeah. in the south, uh, an hour south of um, London. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, how can I help? Um, basically, um, I was I've tried many different things over the years, and I thought I found what direction to take my career in. Uh, but I guess I'm kind of struggling to find my lane. I was recently in a job which I thought was kind of a good fit for me, um, but they they let me go after two and a half weeks because they said I wasn't experienced enough. And it kind of knocked my confidence a mm. bit. And now I'm in a position where I'm, I'm doubting if it is the right, I'm doubting if it was the right choice and um, just feeling a little bit lost. Do you agree that you didn't have enough experience to actually pull it off? Or do you think they, they think they are making an excuse out of that? What do you think went wrong? Um, I think, to be honest, I was really clear on my on my resume on the interview I told them my experience and uh, I felt like I was actually doing a great job for the first two weeks um, but it seemed like they wanted someone who could just come in and just not have not be trained at all and just do the role without any um, just hit the ground running basically but I, I I thought I was I thought I was nailing the job to be honest but according to them I wasn't experienced enough for them they need someone who's been doing it four or five years Okay. Well, and, and, uh, uh, if they hadn't, but the, the thing is, I left my old job for this as well, and it kind of, it just messed me around because I, I quit you. my job, went I to this you. job, and then after two weeks, I'm gone. Okay. Well, first of all, let's talk about the emotional side of this. This sucks. There's just no other way around it, and it, it does knock your confidence. But I'm not seeing any real evidence, and you've got to be. I mean, I I can only go off of what you're telling me, but based on what you've told me. Um, it's not like you were dropping balls, you were blowing stuff up, you know, you were causing train wrecks to happen every day. Sounds to me like they need, you needed a little more hands-on training to, uh, to, yeah. And, uh, the parts that they were training you on, you were growing and you were getting better, right? Yeah. yeah I just think, and I, that's what I thought. I thought. well, here's the deal. I think this is yeah. poor leadership and I would, I, first of all, I understand why you're feeling uh, a lack of confidence, but I don't want you to continue to feel that because I don't think there's any evidence that says mm-hmm. you can't do that job. Because what I'm hearing is, yeah. had they stuck with you a little bit longer and trained you, been a little bit patient because they don't want to spend time training you, they want to go do whatever they're doing. And yeah, that and and you were honest in your resume, you were honest in the interview, and I think what I want you to do is not be confused by this. Because this is a confusing okay. situation. But wait a second, what do we know? Yeah. You do love the work, enjoy the work. It, it's still something that, had they not done that to you, you wouldn't be calling me with any confusion, correct? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I was enjoying the job. Um, for years, I actually, I mean, I probably had two, two jobs in my life which I actually really enjoyed, and this was one of them. Okay, then. Um, so, so hold so, on to that. Yeah, I guess. Hold on to yeah, that. Yeah, give it more time. Yeah. yeah. 
So wait a second. Let's look yeah. for that. So here's what we do. We look for that. We look for similar work. We look for a little bit better culture. And then here's what we explain. We go, hey, they brought me in. I told them what my experience level was. And uh, they still hired me anyway. And they were like, man, this is just going to take more training. And we're not we're not in that position. You're just going to have to own this. Okay. Or, yeah. or you were only there two weeks. You don't even put it on your resume. <laughs> yeah, that's probably what I'll do, to be honest. I mean, that's not lying. It's just everybody doesn't need yeah. the, the whole truth. And so I, I think you get your head up. I think you need to heal and realize, wait a second, I'm not a doofus. I really enjoyed this work. This just wasn't the right place for me. And let's take it as a sign. Let's take it as a nudge into the right direction for your future. Get your head up, man. Keep moving forward. I'm proud of you. Thank you for the call. Coming up, more of The Ken Coleman Show. Are you wondering if you should leave your current job or stay put? Well, you're not alone. That's why we created the Should I Quit My Job quiz. In just five minutes or less, this quiz will help you determine if you're at the right company and if you're in the right role. And if you need to make a move, you'll get practical steps to keep you moving forward. Folks, it's time to get unstuck. Life is too short not to do what you were created to do. Go take the quiz right now at kencoleman.com quiz. The Ken Coleman Show continues to help you find work that matters to you so you can make more money and experience more meaning. Thank you so much for joining us. 844-747-2577. Let's go to Matt in Beloit, Wisconsin. I've never been to Beloit, but I will tell you, it is now one of my top 10 favorite cities in America to say. It's up there in the top 10 with Sheboygan. Uh, Sheboygan, pro- it still remains all time number one, without question. Uh, but Beloit, I like that. Bel- Bel- Beloit, I like saying that. There you go. All right, Matt, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, Ken. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm loving your show. Thank you, sir. How can I help? Uh, my question is, is uh, how do I start fresh in a new job after leaving a pretty, pretty bad workplace. Mm. Well, I'm going to give you the high level answer. Then we'll unpack it. How about that? High level answer is how do I start fresh after I've left a toxic job? Well, number one, you need to heal. Number two, after you've had a chance to heal, I mean the real pain, man, real stuff, the hurt, whatever happened. We'll get into that. Uh, First thing we want to do is heal. That's step one. Step two is we want to learn. Now that we are healthy enough to have true perspective, let's look back on it and go, what can I learn from this so that I don't ever put myself in this position again? How do I see this in other places? Um, and and after we learn, then I want you to uh, make sure that you're clear. This is into my seven stages now. Get clear and on uh, where you want to go, why you want to go, and uh, you've healed, you've learned, and so now you don't drag that with you. And you truly do choose to start fresh. And you go, you know what? Um, nobody ever likes suck. Nobody ever likes pain. Nobody ever likes experiencing toxicity. But there is something to learn from it, which will then make you stronger and better. So that that's my high-level answer. So what happened? I love it. Thank you, Ken. Uh, yeah, so I started at this place uh, where I currently work, and I'm leaving shortly three years ago. Uh, with some friends recommend, recommending it, said it was great. Uh, got in here, and uh, leadership seemed really passionate and kind, but everything just always seemed a little bit off. Um, pretty soon, with the start of COVID, my coworkers got fired for what later came out to be unjustified reasons, and then eventually, the uh, executive director here who, of 30 years was uh, walked out, and so it was pretty evident that she was doing some pretty sketchy stuff. And, you know, her family was all hired in and they were all getting raises and became like a very, you know, ran by this one person and their whole family and a lot of uh, toxic leadership as far as, you know, people get rewarded for keeping the mouth shut or, or uh, brown nosing. 
And uh, I just got a new boss two weeks ago who was fantastic. Uh, I was very excited. And then I got an opportunity to go make more money uh, doing the same thing somewhere else. So I decided to take it. And uh, but I just, I just want to, you know, take off the baggage of this, of this old stuff, of this bad leadership. Yeah. Like you said, learn how to never have this happen again. Yeah. Um, and and go into this new, uh, leading a new team. I was a department leader um, without having that old stuff on me. Yeah, you know, I, I think you have to say, what are the signs? What could I have done to dig into those signs to confirm that they mm-hmm. were, in fact, red flags? I think yeah. that's a big learning based on what you just told me. I think that's a big takeaway. Something seemed off. And so I think one lesson is, is you got to trust yourself. Because mm-hmm. you were that's right. Great. You were right. And so dig. When something's off, dig. Don't don't ignore it. Don't dismiss it. Dig. There's 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 your big thing. When something feels off, don't dismiss. Dig. Oh, I love good alliteration when it presents itself. <laughs> okay, I I think that's a biggie. Is there another one that now that I've kind of given you an example, what's another lesson? Um, I I I just think I agree with you on uh, on noticing what the signs are and, and following my gut on this, that when something feels off to kind of yeah. not sit back, and, but, but mm-hmm. dig in and work with other folks and kind of figure out what's going on. And I just learned so much on what leadership is and isn't in these last two years. So I, Bingo. I feel excited to start fresh. Now. Bingo. That's what I was hoping you were going to say. You have yeah. at least one or two really glaring examples of what poor leadership is. And so you get a mm-hmm. little bit of a head start and a life hack to go, all right, I know that yeah. if I don't do these two things, I'm not going to be a horrible leader, <laughs> yeah. you know, and what's the, what's the converse to the horrible stuff? What's the yeah, positive? And I definitely, side? Yeah. When I, when I was feeling low, I definitely felt myself slipping into their bad leadership styles and then realizing what I was doing to my team uh, when doing it. And then just had to shake myself loose and say, don't do that. Like you got to be better than that for them. Yep. Yep. Let me, uh, uh, let me go ahead. I was just going to ask if I could ask a, a part two. Of course. If I had a second. Yeah, go for it. So, well, I was kind of looking for a new job. I did your get clear uh, assessment. Uh huh. And just I'm also wondering how to kind of apply that into my new position. Um, so I, I've been in leadership for the last year, leading a department uh, in, a, in a nonprofit world, working uh-huh. with homeless veterans. Mm-hmm. My new place is going to be doing job uh, assistance uh, for another nonprofit. Uh huh. Um, I like leadership, but it's not necessarily more my, my gut clear. It's not necessarily my, always my exact strengths. So, uh, what were your top talents? Uh, logic, inspection, and discernment. Okay. And passions of, uh, research, making, and solving. So I, I really like kind of figuring problems out, you know, tinkering with things, making new stuff to solve problems. Um, and I think I do leadership pretty well. What kind of problems do you, what kind of problems do you most love to solve? Are they pe- really, uh, people problems? I'm going to give you your your answer key. Okay, mm-hmm. this is a uh, multiple choice. You can circle more than one. People problems, process problems, idea problems, or thing problems like things. Uh, process is definitely up there for sure. Um, okay. My mission from you was efficiency, and I, I love uh, trying to make things make more sense, make more efficiency. Okay. Um, so does a I, leader? Does a leader? Who has the talent of logic, who's a really good thinker, you're analytical, who is very detail-oriented, inspection, you're kind of a natural critic. You've also got a great people skill of discernment. What were your top three uh, passions? That's what you do best, what we just said. What do you What do you love to do most, you said? Researching, making, and solving. Okay, so researching, that's digging in. Okay, mm-hmm. researching is certainly a cousin to logic, Yes. Mm-hmm. Research is certainly a cousin to inspection, yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Um, this is great. If you read that again, you go, would a good leader, could a could a person be a good leader with those talents and that passion? What's yeah. the answer? Absolutely. Of Absolutely. course. You don't have to have, you don't, you don't have to score high in the in, in leadership or influence. You don't have to score high to be a leader. This is, remember, this assessment reveals your unique makeup, your unique mm-hmm. cocktail. Everybody's a different cocktail drink, right? Mm-hmm. What it's telling you is, is that's where you need to spend your time as a leader. 
Mm. You look at your passion line, and if you're not spending 75% of your day doing that type of work, as a leader, you will not be in your sweet spot. Yeah. So, same thing with talent. If you're not spending 75% of your day analyzing that, using that logical head of yours, inspecting processes, systems, if you're not then discerning who's winning in this process or what part of this process is broken, if you're not spending 75% of your day doing that work you love, that you're good at, you're not in your sweet spot. So this is now a leadership job description for you, meaning leadership is leadership, helping people win. But that's how you do it. You understand? That makes sense. My man. Folks, that's why the Get Clear assessment is so, I'm proud of it. Not because of arrogance or pride. That right there, that's how you spend 75% of your day. You do that, guess what? Not only do you experience tremendous meaning, you are going to be really freaking good at it. And oh, by the way, here come the dollar signs. They will promote you up the ladder. You want to make a great impact as a leader? Spend 75% of your day leading the way you're supposed to lead. There it is. All right, to our listening audience, I got to get out of here. You matter. You have what it takes. To our viewing audience, hang on. We got a bonus segment coming up. Press on. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show, where we help you experience more meaning, which is going to turn into more money. Woo, boy, who doesn't want that, right? Don't just chase money, chase meaning. The money follows that. 844-747-2577 is the number. Amy joins us in Portland, Oregon. Amy, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, thank you so much. It's an opportunity to speak with you. Well, I'm thrilled to talk to you. What's up? (laughs) Well, uh, I was calling you because I had been in a job for 14 years and it just wasn't, I I wasn't excited every time I got to work and I never wanted to go to bed because I didn't want to wake up and be in the same spot again. I kind of outgrew that job and I did it to do it. It wasn't really my passion. And now I'm in that process of trying to find out what I really want to do. Uh, So I pulled up uh, your books. I started off with the proximity principle and then my husband and I figured out that you had come out with uh, From Paycheck to Purpose. Yeah. So I'm stuck, and I'm calling you to see if you can help me with that. Okay. Where do you feel you're stuck? Uh, right where, it's, where it asks you where your mission and your passions are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, two things. Yeah. Um, one, I don't think you're stuck. <laughs> I think that okay. you are – I think that you're doubtful. I think that you doubt yourself. You're doubting something. Oh, for sure. <laughs> okay, yes. then. Well, let's dig into this. What do you doubt? Okay, great. What is your, what's the voice of doubt telling you? And I want you to be, don't be fancy. I'm not a fancy guy. <laughs> I'm not fancy. I want real talk. What is the okay. voice of doubt telling you? Um, well, my whole life I've had to survive on my own financially. Mm-hmm. And now I'm in a situation with my husband where he wants me to find what my real passion is. Good. And I really haven't felt, I know he's great. I really haven't felt like I've had that opportunity my whole life. So I'm kind of at a loss as to what I want to do because financially, you know, doing what I used to want to do isn't really, you know, lucrative you know wait Uh, a second (laughs) i asked you to tell me what the voice of doubt is telling you so either you didn't tell me or i'm on the wrong nerve which i'm fine with 
<laughs> are you a per? I think your doubt is you doubt you can do what you dreamed of doing, or you doubt that it will re- that it will give you enough income. Is that right? Yes. Okay. You said a minute ago. I just don't know, Ken, if what I used to want to do, what did you used to want to do? Which, by the way, you didn't used to. You still want to do it. What is it? Well, I wanted to be some kind of an artist. Uh, I did go to art school. I did study graphic design. Then I studied art education. And then I just kind of saw that my friends weren't making a lot of these kind of jobs. I get it. But I don't care about all that. You're going, oh my gosh, I thought Ken was nice and he was for me. No, I am. I just don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about what you thought. I want to yeah. talk about what you feel. What kind of artist did you dream of being? Be specific. Um, I'm just a fine artist. But that was a long time a ago. A what artist? A, like a fine artist. What does that With mean? With linoleum cuts and canvas painting. Et oh, got it. See, I didn't even know that. That's great. <laughs> I don't, but listen, who cares that it was a long time ago? There's more in this. I'm okay with that getting a little bit more defined or maybe changed, sure. but you want to create stuff. Yes, I'm a creative person. I know. <laughs> so what are, here's the first homework exercise for you. Sure. But I'm going to quiz you on it now. Homework assignment. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, I know, but because I want you to stop thinking and start feeling. Homework exercises, I want you to really do some research on all the different ways to make money creating something. I mean, sculptor, painter, whatever, interior design, I don't care. I want you to truly begin to let your mind see all the things that are connected to the idea of being a painter. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. All right. Now, off the top of your head, here's the quiz. What's something that is similar to painting that is very creative in nature, but it is a totally different uh, sector or maybe different industry? Well, I, it actually got integrated into what I was doing professionally, which was screen printing, which was putting art on apparel. Okay. Yeah. So and that's you... what I was doing, but I was running the facility at the point where, when I left. And that's not where I wanted to be. What did you? Where did you want to be? Um, you wanted to be graphically well, designing the stuff that somebody else would slap yes. on the shirt. Mm-hmm. Okay, then graphic designer. You actually mentioned that earlier. That's one option. I'm not saying it's I the option. That, yeah. Well, wait a second. Is that art or not? It is. You better believe <laughs> it is. That's art. Yes. Graphic design is one option. You can make good money in as a graphic designer. True or false? True. Okay. Is it possible that you could get into a job like graphic design where it's not exactly what you dreamed of, but it is fundamentally the creative work that you long to do? And then if you get successful in that, let's say you're making 75, 80, 85, maybe six figures, whatever, who knows? And you start painting again on the side and you sell that too. Or maybe you get into something else and you realize, right. There's all kinds of small business opportunities to work for myself and do very well as a creative person who expresses art in a way that people need it. That's all you've got to do. That's your homework assignment. Now, here's the deal. I'm gonna, I yeah. want you to hang on the line. Amanda's okay. going to give you my Get Clear Career Assessment because you've got the book from Paycheck to Purpose, which tells you how to climb mm-hmm. the mountain. I want you to take the assessment because I think it's going to verify your mountain, Okay. Okay. So hang great. on the line. Thank you so much. But you you better do your homework. But this I will. <laughs> good. To get clear. What careers. else do I have to do right now? I'm unemployed. Ken. There you go. Well, that's the other thing. Go get a job being creative somewhere right now in Portland, Oregon. I mean it. Go get a job that is creative. I don't care if it's creating flower arrangements at Whole Foods. Go do that. I'm as serious okay. as I can be. Because you gotta get your creative juices flowing again. You gotta get them flowing. And when we get them flowing, you'll start to see things because you're experiencing creativity. That's what you need to be doing. Because every day that you sit at home, that you're not being creative, watch what's happening. Your soul is shrinking. I want you to go get creative while you do your homework, while you take the Get Clear career assessment. All right. I got to get out of here. But before I do, remember this. You matter. And you do have what it takes. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Press on. Press on.